Welcome to the Friday, maybe Saturday edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 427. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm Gavin Ashenden, and we're very much hoping that when you hear this, it's probably going to be the 11th of August, 2018. And if you're in England, the weather will be totally unpredictable. <laughs> Indeed. Three, two, one. You know, at some point, people will gather that we don't always record on the same day we publish because uh, sometimes I have two or three podcasts recorded on the same day. George, you know, here, Gavin here, maybe uh, Archbishop Foley here. It's a, it's all scattered all over. And so we want to scatter it out in uh, publishing so people don't have to listen to five uh, shows a day. However, there are people out there who want to listen to five shows a day. Gavin, I just did an episode with George where we talked about his health. Everybody on the show is over 50, so let's talk a little bit about your health. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're very kind. Uh, well, my leg hurts, but it's getting better. Oh, I think that good. sums it up. <laughs> um, I have to walk uh, every, every every day. The, the surgeon said um, when he saw me after the operation, I just want to let you know there's no physiotherapy. Just walk. Just walk. Uh, so I um, I walk a little further every day. And the important thing is not to walk too fast. Um, if you walk too fast, you may not make it home is the lesson I've discovered. Um, so uh, I, I'm, I'm very excited at how far I've managed to walk. But uh, it's certainly true that, that any time after tea time and um, uh, the level of the level of, of pain ratchets up a great deal. But it's the feast of St. Lawrence today. And in our morning prayers, we read about how poor Lawrence was 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 griddled very badly. So I feel really very bad talking about post-operative pain, firstly, because I'm getting better. And secondly, because we have the examples of the martyrs and um, they, they, you know, they knew what pain was, whereas we uh, uh, we have paracetamol. <laughs> <laughs> well, if I remember correctly, Lawrence was an Anglican's Anglican because he was commented or uh, complimented for his liturgy. I, am I right in remembering that? Well, he, it, it's an amazing story. First of all, I'm terribly, if anyone can help me, I'm terribly excited about the cup from the Last Supper because in a, in a, in a Spanish monastery, they think they have the one that Jesus used and they got it from Lawrence. So um, it was smuggled, Lawrence died in 258. And there's a tradition very well attested that it was smuggled to Spain to hide it because the, um, uh, the, the the emperor who persecuted Lawrence in Rome said, uh, we, we think you're rich and we want all your treasure. So tomorrow produce your treasure, O Christian community. So Lawrence got hold of all the widows and the orphans and he made a huge column of them. And, and he said to the emperor, I, I, round, this, round the corner any moment will come the procession of our treasure. And, and out came all the widows and the orphans crawling along in a state of various decrepitude. And he said, this is what we spent our money on. And uh, the emperor was very cross and immediately martyred him. But when St. Leo talks about Lawrence, they talk about a man full of the Holy Spirit, full of the gospel, full of faith and amazing at the liturgy. And one of the things that tells us is that in the year, just 100 years after Polycarp, mm -hmm. who was taught everything by John, the apostolic church saw as one of its strengths as offering liturgical worship in the spirit to God in a way that we seem to have become really quite detached by, perhaps to our loss. Uh, yeah, indeed. So you're talking about the next Indiana Jones episode there, uh, searching for the... Uh, the, 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 the <laughs> I very badly want, I want, a, I want a mock up of this chalice. That, uh, I went on to Amazon to see whether or not, you know, somebody, some firm has done a, a replica of, uh, of this chalice that, that was maybe the one that our Lord used. It, it's very beautiful. Mm -hmm. It's got an onyx, an onyx basin and... Um, uh, there's a marvelous book I've just been reading um, by, by uh, an, an English professor of biology at Cambridge. And one of the things he does in this book that's come out recently is to solve the synoptic Johannine problem on the Last Supper because he says that Jesus was following the Essene cal calendar, the, the pre-Jerusalem calendar. And so the Passover happened either on Tuesday night or Wednesday night. And we, the reason we know it was an Essene Passover was because the disciples were told to go and find a man carrying a water jar. Sure. Now, no Orthodox Jew carried water jars. This is woman's work. Only women did this. But because the Essenes washed themselves so often, Essene men did carry water jars. So this was almost certainly a Last Supper prepared by an Essene man following the Essene calendar 
giving us two or three nights before the betrayal and the and the and anyway it's a piece of very exciting theology that um uh, I've been reading it oh, You're very excited about it, we could tell. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> Steven Spielberg will get the same bug and make a nice little movie about it too. All right, um, now from time, as far as I can remember, and I, I certainly love reading about history, uh, when you've lost in a battle and your fort is you know, uh, about to be pummeled by the enemy, you raise the white flag. It's over. We give up, we surrender, and stop you know shooting at us stop you know the cannon st stop uh sending the fireballs of oil over we give up and that's the, the the raising of the white flag in terms of the church uh i would say at least at the cathedral level raising the ram uh, the rainbow flag is the same uh type of thing we've given up we don't need to fight culture anymore uh there's no difference between christianity and anything secular uh, we, as a cathedral or a church, are the people's place and we're open to everyone at every time. I say that because I read an article where we are now raising the rainbow flag in England at a uh, cathedral in Ely. Ely. Ely, Ely, Ely is called. My, this my, is the... my apologies, <laughs> Ely. <laughs> Hey, it's so much better than Gloucestershire. Yes, anyway. <laughs> you know me well. <laughs> and um, Ely is the diocese which has the University of Cambridge in it. So mm -hmm. it's um, the middle of England to, to the right of it. Of course, Ely isn't the first cathedral to do this. Um, Southwark has done it. Uh, the, the, there's really quite a long list of cathedrals that have done it, but it's the latest. So um, in Ely, this, this, uh, in a few days' time, there is a pride festival. And in the same way as York Minster, the clergy came out onto the steps and blessed the pride festival. So the Dean of Ely says in order to honour uh, the inclusivity of, of, of homosexuality and to make up for people who haven't been supported by Christians in the past, he's running up the gay pride rainbow, pseudo rainbow flag. Mm -hmm. um, the, one of the problems with this, I, I, so I've written an article about, about this and it, it's been much read. And one of the things I did was to go into the, into the um, library of gay pride photographs and just pull out three uh, photographs. You may you may have access to them already. I think I sent them to you, Kevin. Uh, uh, I'm going to I'm going to put them up on on the the screen right now. For those who are offended or sickened by images like this, just close your eyes. Don't don't watch. And they're up now. They're up now. Pretty disgusting. I know. What's with the black leather? Okay, and you can look again. So the the one of the points I was trying to make was uh, it, it isn't as if the gay pride phenomenon is a, a a long list of sort of a long column of disneyland tourists mm -hmm. of, of of lesbian and gay partners holding each other's hands promising life promising lifelong fidelity although it's often presented as a, about romantic fidelity a gay pride is a pretty a, a, a <laughs> it's it's a pretty full-on um uh festival of lust and sadomasochism uh, at, at if not at its heart, certainly permeating it. Mm -hmm. And if you've ever seen a gay pride festival, uh, and and you you you've seen the uh, overt, pugnacious, versatile sexuality of it, it's very hard indeed to understand how a cathedral would say this is part of human experience, which is the heart of our spirituality too. Um, it, a con trick is being played um, and I think one of the things that we have to do some of us who are orthodox is, is simply for as long as we possibly can say look this has nothing to do with Christianity this is a, a debased kind of anthropology um, whereas you know romance and sex are part of the human condition um, th they are not so central to a Christian anthropology that um, we're entitled to put them on a platform and give them a special pass. The difficulty with the Church at the moment, certainly Anglicanism, the Church of England, is that it seems to have swallowed the bait of secularism almost completely whole. And, and, and part of the difficulty I have is th this is not just something like a kind of theological global warming where we give way. But actually, this has been planned for a long time. So many of the cathedral deans are are either gay uh, or 
have uh, have overtly uh, overt theological sympathies for this this movement it is as if they have been planted or appointed to do this um, wh whether it's york minster or, or london or ely or southwark um, uh, it's it's a it, it's a kind of campaign and to my mind it it's it, it's quite clearly a sort of um uh sexualization of the church of england trying to a accommodate people to the idea of that but b also to 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 curry favor i think from the society there's just been a a a, a an exhibition of paintings in portsmouth cathedral and um again you may you may have the the the, the nude to hand as I, I i sent it to you and and then a few people say well actually we're not really sure that having naked ladies all over the cathedral and their bottoms uh is 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 <laughs> and this naked lady does have a bottom on her, um, and, and I mean, I'm just describing it. But but a spokesperson of the Diocese of Portsmouth said, "Well, we aim. The cathedral aims to be a space open to everybody. Well, you can be a bit too open to bottoms." In my <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, that's the role of the and public library. In my mind, the public libraries are to be open to everybody, all ideas, the, the campuses, the universities, the cathedrals. I, I don't see that. Well, you will see it if you went to Portsmouth right. Cathedral. Yes, exactly <laughs> yes I'll be doing this, of course. Uh, <clears throat> so she's 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 being withdrawn, and and instead Ely have, Ely have taken up the slack with um with letter sadomasochism. But I think one of the things we're trying to say is that um, Christ, uh, a gospel anthropology and uh, uh, this transformation into the likeness of Christ. Is, is something that tames our sexuality, not not something that exploits it or amplifies it. Mm -hmm. uh, it even tames our romanticism. Um, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a transformation of the heart, so that the heart gets increasingly given to Jesus. And it, it's almost as if, certainly contemporary Anglican spirituality in England, um, mainline Anglicanism has simply, as you said at the beginning, just capitulated to the spirit of the age. Yeah, indeed. Uh, it's become the, uh, a bigger public library, so to speak. Um, now, there are changes I see going on and uh, some success. Let's talk a little bit about sure. the good news. Um, and you take it for what it is, and some people go, well, they're not greedle or whatever. But uh, um, Holy Trinity Brompton. Holy Trinity Brompton is the, is, is the most amazing setup. It has... Mm -hmm. um, 49 churches listed in its network that that makes it really almost a denomination in it in its own right and it's very interesting to see how it's developing its strategy um and i think on the whole one has to be very grateful indeed that there is a form of renewed christianity which is uh, attracting people and is vigorous in its evangelism well um, uh, i i want to back up here we, we're saying 49 churches it's not just a one location these are 49 churches uh, largely in London, but spreading out more and more. The, and each of these churches is kind of in direct competition with another or many other Church of England churches. It, yes, it, it, I think I, the, it, one, I got one that of, right, right? One of the things the Church of England has had to come to terms with is mm -hmm. that when Holy Trinity went to Bromden plants, I suppose about 10 years ago, there was a great deal of resentment. People mm -hmm. said, who, who are these people? Yeah, and, sure. uh, is, is, is it Anglican? Um, and that's still a question one can ask. Um, but 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 um, you know we we they are taking away uh, some of the livelier and more committed people from the other parishes and the other deaneries. But things have got so bad now in the parishes that you don't hear that said anymore. They're just very grateful indeed that there are communities of Christians. So in Exeter, for example, there are now three uh, Holy Trinity uh, Brompton plants, and more than that. But they've managed to get 1.69 million pounds from the church commissioners as a grant to fund uh, community and youth workers. So there's there's an enormous amount of money available to them directly from the church commissioners. And I mean, so the, is, is the glass half full or half empty? The half full glass says, well, this is wonderful. We have vigorous, enthusiastic Christian communities being planted where there weren't any. Uh, the half empty glass says, well, wait, wait a moment. Why isn't this money available to dioceses? Uh, does it really have to be the Holy Trinity brand or nothing? And the Holy Trinity Brompton brand does does have questions about it. It it um it it's it's kind of Anglican light. 
uh, there's, 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 there's not a lot of creed in it. I, I think the question is, so would St. Lawrence have found himself at home in it? And I'm afraid I think the answer is from what we read, uh, the answer is no, he wouldn't. But um, it's better than, it must be so much better than nothing. It's Well, it's better than the old hat. The old hat is currently raising the flag and surrendering. You know, the sure. cathedrals, the diocese um, have given up. And to see places like HTB you know, infiltrate the same um, neighborhoods, the same diocese, and bring the gospel, and have growing churches, and showing people that there's a way forward with Christ, um, and, you know, England is not the answer, government's not the answer, uh, your public schools and public hospitals are not the answer, um, you're, you're finding a way forward. A way for well, the church it, it, to succeed, a way for, you know, something that came out of uh, Rome onto the shores of England long, long ago, uh, revitalizing itself. Is it perfect? No. Uh, you're right. I don't find any, if you go and uh, participate in the Alpha series, there's no creedalness to it at all. Um, it's a great introduction to the church and, and to the, the life of Christ, but um, I, there, there's a lot of shortcomings. However, it makes up for so many of the shortcomings of the old Church of England. And it's interesting, am I to understand that Justin Welby supports what HTB is doing uh, on, on the grounds of Church of England? Justin Welby is certainly a product of HTB, mm -hmm. and I can't imagine there's any way that they could have got hold of these enormous sums of church commissioners' money without real support at the centre. I think from Justin Welby's point of view, um, he's pursuing a number of campaigns at the same time, as, as, as indeed a, 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 a chairman of a multi um, uh, a multifaceted organisation might. So, um, and, and, and that's perfectly sensible. I, I think as a strategy goes, it, it's, it's a sensible way to do it. Um, I mean, I myself uh, was was very close to the HTB spirituality early on. I was converted through David Watson. I was part of the early charismatic movement in the 1970s. I was very attracted to what HTB did. I, I think that uh, I found it answering fewer of the kind of Christian questions that I now have as a Christian, but I'm very glad indeed when God uses anything oh, absolutely. To, to, touch, to touch people's lives. So I think we have to say that, as with so many things, this, this is a mixed, uh, a mixed experience, but we have to be grateful and to pray for the fact that our committed Christians who love Jesus, who feed the homeless, as the early church did, and who present a vigorous and enthusiastic commitment to Christ. Whether or not Holy Trinity Brompton is going in a in a direction that will preserve enough distance between it and the Zeitgeist, um, that's a more that's a more specialized question it is. that I, that I think. Is, is is the topic for a more informed discussion one day I, I i assure you we will probably have that uh, discussion well gavin we come up on a, a good oh 18 minutes we've entertained our audience and do i sell smell a little supper over there <laughs> you do the trouble is kevin i'm i'm on this fierce diet i'm surprised you haven't noticed how the no, i have off. I, I had to That's... i keep every time you're on the screen here i keep having to widen the screen because little gavin is disappearing on us you know you're looking good well, one one of one one of the the secrets of this is is that the, the uh, for an evening meal I, I I have cabbage and spinach and the idea is I get to eat something thank God because otherwise what what would I do? <laughs> That's not a diet. But, That's martyrdom. Oh man. Well, it's it, it's certainly it's certainly a change. Of, of, but but the great thing about cabbage and spinach is it's it's pretty calorie light and only it's also quite good for you. Mm -hmm. So. Um, uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure it's the kind of smell that would have you tearing into the kitchen. Oh, no, <laughs> I could smell it from here, though. I'm just saying, you know. <laughs> so do enjoy your diet. <laughs> Thank you, Kevin. Very yeah, yeah. Much. <laughs> no, but uh, you know, you're looking great. Lost some weight, and that's that's important. You know that you got a new hip that you're going to be breaking in. So well, uh, I have. I have to keep the weight off this hip. If yeah. the hip is going to last for a while, the secret is to weigh as little as you can. So we're heading in that direction. I could just see the discussion with the doctor talking about your warranty in 10 years. Saying, well, you, you oh, put... I've got to 
I've got to tell you what he said. If I haven't told you, when, when I was pleading for the operation, and mm -hmm. uh, he said, "Well, you're, you know, you you need lose some weight." I said, "Well, give me a new hip, and I will lose some That's weight. Right. I'll be on my bicycle. I'll, I, I'll I'll walk." And he said, "Well, I, he said, I don't believe you, because our our scientific statistics That's right. are That's right. nobody loses weight after a hip operation, and we have a joke amongst hip surgeons, which mm -hmm. is it's because they can get to the fridge faster." <laughs> yes. Anyway, so I said. To him, <laughs> the next time I see you, I will have lost. I will have lost a stone and a half, and I did. And so I'm an exception to his statistics. That's but good. I'm very aware that all all the evidence is, if you want this thing to last, then you uh, you shed some pounds. So that's what we're about. All right. Do keep Gavin, George, and myself. Myself, I, I got a little cut on my finger and had to get stitches this week. In your <laughs> prayers, we're over fifty. We're falling apart. We're full. You know, we're starting to get spare parts. I'm Kevin Coulson. Uh, I'm Gavin Ashland, and it's episode 427 of Anglican Unscripted. And unlike Paul St. Lawrence, we haven't been martyred yet. <laughs> but give it time. <laughs> Your diet's doing really well. <laughs> That's what they call it, diet, isn't it? Uh...